Good morning, church. Happy day after Christmas. I pray that you had a great Christmas with friends and family. Hope you didn't eat too much. You're cozy, you're at home, you're in your pajamas. I wish I was. Uh, you know, you think about it. This is the end of 2021 and you have made it. On some level, you have survived crazy times, crazy year, actually a crazy two years. I mean, these have been times of volatility, uncertainty, confusion, um, ambiguity. You know, we've had fear. We've had fear mongering. We have political unrest. We've had economic issues. We've had, I mean, the gas prices right now are like four sixty-five a gallon. And trust me when I say this, things can be bad here, but when you go to other parts of the planet, they're even worse. So as I think about, you know, just how, how trying these times are, you know, how do we live? How do we proceed? How do we go into this next year with faith and hope? I will tell you this, that in the midst of no matter how bad the issues you faced this last year were or the trials you're going to face this next year, I can tell you this experientially and biblically that Jesus Christ is in the midst of them. He's not intimidated. He's not shy. He's willing. He's loving. He's powerful. He knows what to do. We're going to trust him. We're going to invite him in to our lives this next year as well as ask him to take care of whatever regrets we have, the pain, the suffering, the loss, and all those things, because he still is Lord. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In light of all these crazy things, how are we to live? What, what does the landscape look like? What does the playing field look like? I want to take some verses familiar out of Matthew chapter 14. This story is replayed in all four Gospels. It's the only miracle story of Jesus that's replayed four times. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so we're going we're gonna to dive in. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. Jesus heard what had happened. He withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. And hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from all the towns. When Jesus landed, he saw a large crowd. And he was moved with compassion and he healed their sick. I will tell you that where there is love and compassion, there will always be some form of healing. And where there's healing, there's always life, and there's always people that want to follow. You know, uh, a month ago, I was in Albania, Macedonia, and Kosovo, and was ministering to some very broken people, very poor people, refugees. And uh, we had a few encounters where um, one time we had a few people that were ministering to some ladies over here. And as they were just talking to them and blessing them and sharing some essentials and some resources with them, they made the comment, you know, the way you talk to us, you make us feel human again. You know, coming from a country like Afghanistan with a bag of clothes to your name and finding yourself in a place that's really unfamiliar and maybe tolerant, but, you know, just really complicated. These, these ladies said, you know, you make us feel human again. You know, we gave a lot of goods, we gave a lot of clothes, we gave a lot of baby supplies, coats, and I felt led to pray at the very end. And so I prayed for, and there's probably 25 people there. We were in the bottom of a parking garage. We just distributed, they were thankful, and I prayed. And when I got done praying, they didn't tell me this, but they told a friend of mine this. They said, when, when Bob prayed, we felt a stirring that is not going away. And it's causing us to rethink how we view Christians. Now, what is that? That is just some simple love and compassion towards some people that don't have anything and desperately need the life and the love of God. So Jesus is doing this thing. He's out there. He's healing. Evening approaches. The disciples come to him and they say, this is a remote place and it's getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Send the crowds away, you know, that just sounds like good self-care and boundaries. <laughs> now think about this. You know, they've been laboring, man. There's people, there's needy people. They're tugging on them. There's no resources. So the, the natural thought, the, the logical conclusion is send these people away. Let me tell you something. The life we live for Christ is many times inconvenient. Uh, it it taxes us. It's called, this is really disruptive to self. And here's my cynical thought. I had this thought. I thought, 
You know, if Jesus had read the popular self-care material today in the Boundaries books, and I believe in those, let me just say this, I believe in those. I don't believe on overdosing on them. I don't believe in making them the main focus of my existence. But if Jesus had read some of the material that's out there today on self-care and boundaries, I'm not sure he would have gone to the cross. Merry Christmas. <laughs> that's a thought there. Was there toxic people? Was there people that didn't contribute to his life? Were there, was there hostility? Was there negativity? Was there uh, an imposition on your life? Yes, but yet Jesus suffered. Let me tell you, the end of our Christian life is not self-preservation. It's becoming the living sacrifice by the grace of God that Jesus calls us to live. And so these di disciples are just, you know, responding. You know, send them away. Let them go do things for themselves. Remember also that in this story right here, what has just happened, the reason they've gotten away is because John the Baptist has been beheaded. And the disciples went and took his body. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. John is beheaded. Somebody's got to take the body. They've got to take the body. They've got to take the head of John the Baptist. They are, they are grieving. I mean, they are suffering. They are mourning. And so is Jesus. And so this story, that's the backdrop of this story. And they're getting away to process this event, to actually grieve in, in solitude. But you've got needy people. And Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. And that's not something, that's not a statement that was made to, to avoid, but to embrace. And so as much as I believe in self-care, and boundaries and all that, we have to realize we're not called to, to a 24-7 comfortable life. And Jesus and the disciples are demonstrating this. And so I want you to think about this for a minute. And here's a question. I really just want to ask you like three questions as we close 2021 and three questions that will help us uh, step into 2022. And here's the first question. How willing are you to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Now think about that just for a moment. How comfortable are you willing to become with the unfamiliar, with things that aren't predictable, with uncertainty, with risk-taking beyond your comfort zone? See, I don't believe you and I can ever become mature in Christ without being uncomfortable. And that's a question, and that's, are you willing you see, if we're Christ followers, and I believe many and most of you are that are watching this, we have to say, we're followers of Christ. Well, where's Jesus going that we're supposed to follow him into? And, and I can tell you what we see in the Gospels and what we see the role of the church today is this. Jesus goes to some very remote places, some very inconvenient places, solitary places, barren places, Places that are just filled with needs, filled with brokenness, filled with disease, addictions and afflictions of all kinds. And Jesus goes right into that. As Christ followers, on some level, we have to go to the places that Jesus went, the, the places that Jesus goes right now. And they're not convenient places. We have to get used to the tension, ambiguity, and unfamiliar. Jesus is there. Places where, and this is what's great about places like this, and this is true of, of virtually every place that I go to, because t the places I go typically are countries that are very poor, uh, sometimes hostile to the gospel. Um, getting there is, is just painful. I mean, the, the travel itineraries, the, the long flights, the, 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 what's it called when you sit in the airports, the layovers. I mean, man, by the time you get there, you are beat to a pulp, but it's worth it because there's people that are waiting on the other end of our obedience. And so this is where Jesus is going. We gotta get used to tension. We have to get used to ambiguity, the unfamiliar. Really, you and I have to confront the idol of certainty. You see, there's a trap out there that we have this predictable Christian life where we kinda of know how everything's gonna work out. Um, we know how God's going to move, that if we pray a certain way, do a certain thing, give a certain amount, then God's going to respond this way. But I'm telling you, certainty is an idol. You don't have to, these guys don't know how Jesus is going to work this out. He's going to show us, but they don't know how it's going to work out. 
Very seldom do I know how something's going to work out. I don't know. I, I met a refugee young girl in crisis in a refugee tent December of 2019, and I'm preaching Jesus to her. I'm praying for her. I'm demonstrating the love of God, but I'm also instilling hope in her that my belief is that God can get her out of that situation. Well, here we are two years later, and she's still there. Do I still believe that? Absolutely. Do we correspond through what's that? Absolutely. Do I, do, is my faith failing? Absolutely not. And as of right now, there are some things in the works right now with some people from some other countries that it's a strong possibility and high likelihood that in the next couple of months, she will be able to get out of there. I don't know how it's going to work out. I never do. In fact, a lot of times, I know we're supposed to pray and then commit to something, but I have found in my little dysfunctional thinking, I tend to commit first and then pray. <laughs> I'm not recommending that. But I know that God's heart for the world is full of compassion, full of mercy, full of resources. And I know that he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And as I follow him, I'm supposed to be part of that too. We started some schools in Haiti, first through third grade. I had no idea how it was going to be happening. I had no idea how it was going to get resourced. But I committed to it, and then the resources started coming in. So just avoid the trap of trying to figure everything out on the front end, and maybe committing to what's right, being obedient, and then letting God take care of the resources on the back end. I mean, here's one like that's happening right now. <laughs> so if you remember, we raised some money for a, a, a pretty good-sized um, children's worship chapel slash uh, community center and classrooms. And I saw the plan. It was a very simple plan. It was like um, 40 feet by 60 feet. Okay, so I said, that's good. How much do you think we can do that for with bathrooms? And it was like $25,000. And so through The Rock and, and many of you and my nonprofit, we raised $25,000. Boom, we got it going. Well, something got lost in the translation. And when the foreman on the job uh, started building it, I went back down there after it had been like 20% mm, of the way done. And when I saw it, it was huge. And I thought, this isn't, this isn't what we signed up for. Well, I was speaking in feet, and they were hearing in meters. So this little 40 by 60 now turns in to 120 by 180, and it's a mammoth. And guess what? It's going to cost a lot more money. How's it going to happen? Have no clue. Have no idea. Started schools, started churches. Don't know how it's going to happen. Ministering to, to refugees in Albania have no idea, but I can tell you when we do the things that God wants us to do and follow Jesus to the places he's going, he'll take care of the bill. He'll, he'll resource it. He'll finance it. In fact, this last trip, I mean, this happened a week ago. One particular thing that we're going to do for 100 Albanian, mainly women and widows uh, that have suffered a lot of loss and a lot of tragedy in their families, very poor. Most of them have never been to a restaurant. We're going to do a big Christmas dinner for them in a restaurant. And I found out how much everything was going to be, the resources we were going to supply, the clothes, the food, all those things. It was going to be $5,000. I made a text. I sent it to six or seven people. I said, this is what we're doing. This is where we're doing it. If you can help, that would be awesome. I sent it to six or seven individuals. And when I was done, as soon as I hit the last button and sent it, I prayed. In the middle of my prayer, my phone started vibrating. I said, in Jesus' name, amen. Boom. First person responded. They said, I will give $2,500 matching funds. The next guy texted me, and he said, I'll give what you need. I said, I have matching funds. He said, I've got it. $5,000 was met in less than 60 seconds in a prayer. I had no idea. That's how God works. Why? Because he loves the people that we're going to. He has a heart. He's compassionate. And as all we need to do is ask. In fact, I would tell you, I found some notes. I'm a terrible journaler. My journals consist of little post-it notes left all over the house in my desk. And what happens is I tend to, sometimes I find something from a few years ago. And I found one of my little journal entries, post-it note. And here's what it said. Jesus is asking me to ask for more. 
Not for me. I don't have a lot of needs. I need to do what he's called me to do. But he wants me to ask for more. And as I look back to that point, and that was two or three years ago, I realized my prayers have been asking for more. More for disadvantaged people, marginalized people, poor people in other countries. And as we ask for more, as we pray big, God shows up. So think about that. How willing are you to go to uncomfortable places? Becoming comfortable with the uncomfortable. Verse 16, Jesus replied, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. That's got to be the longest pause in history. With disciples who are still immature, still learning how to follow Jesus. Now there's thousands of people and they got nothing. Imagine how small you would feel. Here's Jesus, the Son of God, looking at you and say, you feed him. And you got all these people looking at you, and you realize you got no game. I'd like to think if I put myself back in that scenario, if Jesus asked me, how would I have responded? Would I have passed the buck on somebody else? Or would I have stepped up? Would I have said, all right, let's do it. I don't know how we're going to do it. Let's do it. How would you have responded? You hear the disciples are getting called out. Actually not called out. They're getting called up to a higher level of faith, a higher dimension of believing, a higher level of trust. They don't, you give them something to eat. If we're partakers of the divine nature of God, then we're called to be participators with God in his activities. We are. We're partakers of the divine nature. First Peter says that. If that's true, we're called to participate. Not just sit back and watch. Not just watch other people take risks. Go bold. No, no, no. We're called to be in the same game as everybody else. This story is a great picture of that. Verse 17. Here's what they responded. We only have five loaves, two fish. True. That was absolutely true. And I get it. Logic says too little, says not enough, can't work, probably won't work, not possible, never been done before, we're going to look stupid, this is going to be embarrassing. I mean, this is absolutely risky. What Jesus is doing is he's confronting their lack of vision. I call it ecclesiastical myopia. That's church nearsightedness, where the focus becomes very small, the focus becomes on a building. The focus becomes on what we don't have, and it's narrow. It's not far-reaching. I will tell you this from experience. Walking with the Lord for 39 or 40 years, spiritual vision increases with age, not decreases. The reason for that is because as you go and traverse this life of faith with Jesus, you see more. And because you've seen more, you see more now. I have more clarity now. I have more scope and vision what God's doing, what he wants to do, and how he's going to do that than I've ever had before. And that's only because I keep seeing him do great things in people's lives. He answers prayer. He's there. He still, still heals. It's, it's, it's amazing. Jesus said, bring them here to me. That's always the right response. Whatever you have, whatever you don't have, you bring it to him. He directs people to sit down on the grass and taking the loaves, two fish. He looked up to heaven. He gave thanks and he broke the loaves. Here's the second question. What are you most grateful for this year? I can tell you if you want to finish well and you want to start well, be grateful. Uh, I have cultivated a discipline where every year, not just once or twice, but a couple of times and then at the end of the year, I go through a lot of the year, the pictures. Right now I have 10,000 544 pictures on my phone, and they're not backed up. 1,700 videos. And as I scroll back, and as I look, you know what I see? Oh, God did that there. Oh, that's right. God healed that person right there. Oh, that church got built. Oh, that church got dedicated. Oh, there was a catastrophic earthquake in Haiti, and I was there. And I was in the midst of just a new level of death and suffering, but yet God was still there, providing, healing, resourcing. We were a part of that. What are you grateful for? First Thessalonians, in everything, everything, not for everything, but in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you. 
God is in the midst. You may not see it. You may not perceive it. You may not understand how, but I can tell you, he, Jesus, is present. He's going to do something. He is doing something, even if you and I don't realize it. Begin to cultivate the discipline of gratitude. It's good for your soul. It keeps you away from entitlement. It keeps your heart centered. Gave to the disciples, and this is discipleship. This is it right here. He gave to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the people. That's Discipleship 101. We come to Jesus with our lack, with nothing, with our spiritual bankruptcy. He gives us grace. He gives us mercy. He gives us love. He gives us what we need. And then we don't hoard it for ourselves. No, we're called to be a blessing. We then turn and distribute whatever God has given us. That's the life of a disciple. And it's a satisfying life. And then here's the third question. When was the last time you were in awe of God and in awe of what God is doing around the globe, around your neighborhood, in your family. When was the last time, I don't mean when was the last time you read your Bible or when was the last time you prayed or when was the last time you went to church. My question is when was the last time you ever sat back and thought, God is really up to something big. God is really doing something significant. God is really showing up in majestic form. I tell you, I look, I, I look around my life and it's, it's like, I, I almost hesitate to share because I don't, I don't want it to, I'm, I'm, I'm an average guy, you know? I got my weaknesses. I follow Christ the best I can. I follow him with a limp, but as I look at my life, I'm, I'm thinking how blessed I am. I look at 37 years of marriage, you know, it's amazing. Three kids, four grandkids, amazing. Felt led to start a nonprofit four years ago this month. And every year it's increasing without any advertising, without just a small word of mouth and then going and people watching what you're doing. And because of that, there's needs being met all over the planet. It's, it's an amazing thing. But when was the last time you actually sat back and you know realized that God really intervened? God really did an amazing thing in your life. And I would tell you, sometimes in this fast-paced, busy life, what gets marginalized is the activity of God. And I would encourage you to get alone and spend some time and ask God, say, God, show me where, where you've been active that I've been negligent in seeing or my lack of vision. Where does your help come from? Who do you look for for provision? Psalm 121, verse one, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You may not be doing good right now. You may have challenges everywhere. But I want to ask you, what are you looking at when you have nothing? Where are you looking when you realize you don't have enough of fill in the blank? If you're looking to man, if you're looking to government, I think you're going to be disappointed. If you look to God, you look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, I think you'll be amazed. So I want to pray for you right now. Love you. It's a great time to reassess, to reflect, and refocus. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person that has watched this, is watching this, and will watch it. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would ignite and make alive truths and principles from your scriptures, God. And the result would be life, would be healing, would be compassion, would be a new vision, a new change in the heart, God. I pray that you would help us live the way that you called us to live, not in self-preservation and our world being all about us, but as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. Church, I bless you in the name of Jesus. And my prayer is that you have a great 2022 in Jesus' name. Amen.